Thank you, Anthony. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, so I'm going to start uh, just with uh, a kind of uh, general overview um, and a kind of uh, sense of um, how this project got kicked off um, to begin with, and it was way back in 2018. Um, and then uh, Chris and I are going to read from our introduction, and then we're going to have a chat with Yoko about um, her project and how it intersects with ours, and then we will open for questions. Um, okay, so yeah, so after being approached by Ivy Publishing to write a book about books in 2018, I asked Chris uh, if they wanted to co-author, and very happily for me, um, at least they agreed. Um, initially, the project was envisaged as a kind of best of, uh, a kind of top 150 philosophy books of all time, featuring all the usual names, so Plato, Plato and, and, and that, that gang. Um, but through conversation with Chris and further conversations with our excellent editor, Tom Kitch, um, who just a big shout out to Tom, uh, we managed to develop it into something much more engaged and hopefully more engaging. Philosophical concepts and theories are far from politically inert and we've aimed, if only roughly given time and space constraints, to capture some of the ways different philosophies have throughout history intersected with projects of empire. And obviously there are a number of gaps, uh, but we've been helped in bridging them by our readers, um, John Arden Ganeri, um, Dag Herbjornsrud, and of course Yoko, um, who we're delighted to be able to talk to today um, so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna have a, a little read of the introduction, and then we're gonna um, open the conversation out a little bit. Yeah, and um, I'm starting with the introduction. Yes, okay. Books are surprisingly hard to burn. The paper from which they're made is often so tightly compacted that there's insufficient oxygen for them to easily catch. It doesn't stop people from trying. Well, the book as we know it today, so printed sheets of paper, bounding covers, it's a relatively recent innovation, but the burning of literary books has a history as long as it is troubling. Among the first ever recorded burnings are those in 221 BCE, ordered by the first emperor of the Qin dynasty as a statement of his new empire's anti ruist ideology. Scrolls and scripts from around the provinces were burned by the wagon load. Then there's the raising of the Library of Alexandria by Roman forces under the direction of Julius Caesar as part of his campaign against um, Ptolemaic Egypt. In the 12th century, the supporters of Mohammed bin Bhaktia Khalji set fire to the library at the Indian Nalanda University, creating a blaze so fierce it supposedly took months to die out. The streets of Florence were coated with ash after the spontaneous bonfire of the Vanities in 1497, and in 1562, Bishop Diego de Landa Calderon ordered the burning of Maya books in the city of Mani in Yucatan, Mexico. Somewhat later, in 1847, uh, in fact, in 1814, British forces set the Library of Congre Congress in Washington ablaze in retaliation for American attacks in Canada. And in the 1930s, the National Socialist Nazi Party conducted a widespread campaign of ceremonial book burnings throughout Germany and Austria targeting anti-fascist or socialist literature and works by Jewish authors. Why would anyone want to burn a book? Because books are incendiary in more senses than one. They're powerful. The printed page can contain radical ideas as such books can be subject to censure and censorship, even to hatred. Books are symbols, ciphers, and carriers of explosive and challenging philosophies that other groups may seek to suppress. Book burnings stand alongside similar forms of cultural assault, such as the destruction of archaeological sites and attacks upon religious monuments. They play as important a role in warfare today as they did in days past. Witness the damage sustained by the Iraq National Library and Archive in Baghdad during the 2003 invasion of Iraq by the United States and Allied forces. The 8,000 rare texts that were burned when the militant group Daesh, ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, detonated a bomb in Mosul Public Library in 2015. They're among the most recent losses, but they will not be the last. It is the power of books that makes book burnings themselves demonstrations of power. They are threats and expressions of force, as well as a marking of both territorial and cultural borders. At the same time that the Nazis were throwing banned books, philosophical or otherwise, onto bonfires, they were handing out copies of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, printed into hundreds of thousands by the state. 
In so doing, they demarcated the ideological space within which their movement lived. This, they were saying, is what falls within, and that falls without. This is acceptable, and that is forbidden. So this practice, practice of cultural and philosophical demarcation also takes other less inflammatory forms. Linda Nochlin, Charles Mills and Michael Apple are among the many who have shown that the suppression of literature also occurs in the creation of literary canons, curricula, syllabi and lists of great works. As a process, it's less eye-catching than the fire and fury of burning books, but consequently it's more pernicious and less easily arrested. By subtle and insidious means, certain figures are pushed to the margins of history, even as others are celebrated, championed their names inscribed on the facades of learned institutions. And we're seeing that at the moment with Cecil Rhodes. Mm -hmm. um, it is all part of a system of memory management of which book burnings are simply the most visible manifestation. One question that we've encountered in the writing of this book is why some works are deemed classics of philosophical literature. And another intimately related question is what makes the work of philosophical literature and, rippling out from this, the question of what exactly is philosophy. Well, maybe there's no single essential feature, nor even a determinate collection of features, uh, that makes a text a work of philosophy. Perhaps, to use a concept developed by Ludwig Wittgenstein, we group works of philosophy by family resemblance. So, Members of a group partake of some set of a series of overlapping similarities, but no single feature is shared by all of them. Well, it might be hard to look down exactly what constitutes a work of philosophy. It might just be that we know one when we see it. Unfortunately, there are serious issues with a method that relies in whole or in part on statements that individuals look the same or claims that you can just tell. These issues that Wittgenstein as a Jewish man living through the rise of Nazism and as a queer man forced to hide his sexual identity would have been more sensitive to than many. Individual biases flourish and any list born from this method will reveal more about who is doing the looking and who is doing the telling than about philosophy itself. As European authors educated in an Anglophone tradition, we have been trained, without always being aware of it, to have a very specific very local view of philosophical history. And part of this education being involved, being told that our history is neither specific nor local, but monolithic and impartial. We have been fed Eurocentric reading lists and introductory texts that reinforce an image of philosophy as a series of great works by great men, typically European and typically racialized as white. Our classics reflect what Peter Limbo calls Philhellenism, the love of Hellenic culture. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they all figure prominently. This is no accident. We find it compelling what Martin Bernal says about the British love of Hellenic uh, literature that it arose at the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, when the British Empire was heavily invested in disparaging the cultural output of the Nile Valley and the African peoples that they are enslaving. Philosophical catalogues are deeply enmeshed with projects of empire. So that's our introduction. Yoko, could you... Okay. Um, yeah. What's um, um, very much in the spirit of the project that we do in Hildesheim, I will introduce this in a minute, is the idea our history is a result of a series of exclusions and it just looked to us as completely obvious, right? The history of philosophy are these books and this history, but it's actually, it's not obvious at all. Um, let me quickly introduce what we do in Hildesheim. Um, we have, um, a project is called the Histories of Philosophy in a Global Perspective. It is funded by the German Research Foundation. It started in 2019. Our director is uh, Professor Elberfeld, Rolf Elberfeld, and um, I am among, among the seven researchers, um, research associates, and uh, we work mainly through different languages and in different language worlds what do philosophies of philosophy look like? Yeah, and then we work with, so far, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Italian, Spanish, French, and Russian. These are our 
expertise and we invite other people who can help us with um, data collection. Um, so far, we have a database um, of over 20 languages and those are sort of book titles collected on the history of philosophy in these different languages. We focus on languages rather than nations because uh, Spanish, for instance, no? a lot of things are written in Latin America and that's not Spanish. Uh, that's in Spanish, but it's not a history of not Spain. But what um, is really amazing is the fact that um, in other parts of the world, the history of philosophy looks rather completely different. So you are right to point out our, now we, as um, what we learn in the United States and in Europe, the history of philosophy, which we completely take it to be obvious from Plato and the medievals. I mean, those are sort of a very um, provincial mm -hmm. phenomenon of this part of the world. Um, the rest of the world, um, of course, learn about this, but um, they do history of, they, they conceptualize history of philosophy completely differently. What's very interesting, I wanna point out, is that our normal history of philosophy as we think of it is a fairly late invention. It is a post 18th century um, history of philosophy that gradually came to be established mainly through a German speaking um, we are philosophers, but um, for instance, even within Europe for this period, the history of philosophy um, was quite global already. For instance, mm -hmm. um, uh, Schmezer, Elias Schmezer, uh, Schmezer wrote in 1744, um, it was a history of philosophy he wrote already. That's one of the very early attempts at um, history of philosophy. But that included, um, well, he starts with a long history um, with the German, uh, Jewish philosophy and followed mm -hmm. by Chaldean philosophy, Persian, Arabic, Chinese, Indian, Phoenician, Roman, and then finally Greek, right? So the history of philosophy, even in Europe was very rich. Yeah. Well, what happened in the 19th and 18th and 19th centuries in Europe? Well, that was the time uh, we started to exclude um, religious stuff. We started to exclude anything that's non-Western. So we now live in a world in which um, history of philosophy does not contain the rest of the world, basically, mm -hmm. right? So, um, I mean, your contribution is um, important because you start out off the bat from a very global um, origins and then Throughout the history, your story is um, it picks up now what has been left out. Yeah, there's a um, of course the obvious story of colonialism and a long tradition of um, scientism that plays um, a role in European history. Right, that that sort of sorts out, and then a um, bunch of philosophers sit around and say, "Well, this is real philosophy, and that that's not philosophy." Yeah, this this uh, mm -hmm. sort of a sorting out of what philosophy is about. And we still live with it. So, uh, and then to us, it's obvious, okay, well, philosophy has to include blah, 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 but it's actually not the end of the story. That means um, we will in fact um, have to um, hopefully alter the conception of what philosophy is. And for that purpose, I mean, our project started in uh, uh, 2019, but we go on to, um, include um, sort of a methodological considerations. No? I mean, what counts mm -hmm. as philosophy? What, mm -hmm. And then we want to look at oral histories, um, embodied practices like rituals. And I mean, the ways in which those were completely normally considered as a part of a thought tradition yeah, that got totally excluded now. So to look at um, also non-Western women, because usually there are they have nothing to say, yeah? So, but that's not true at all, right? So they are part of the rich history of creating a thought tradition. So those are the sort of things that we want to now begin to uh, look at. And that's all in sort of consolidated in our website. I don't know if Anthony had um, posted our website. I think he shared but, it, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. But anyway, if you look through this as a 
the uh, language collection is really amazing. And then, and it's really in Arabic or Russian, the history of philosophy looks completely different. And Chinese, of course, a long history of philosophy that has been written. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the sort of thing that we are um, doing a lot of yeah. database creation. And we do want to have uh, sort of like a web portal now. So for, for this kind of a variety of things that um, we can uh, collect. Yeah, and to put together so that people can sort of go in and look at what kind of titles are there and even in the European traditions from the past. Yeah. 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 So maybe I can pick up on the point that you mentioned there, if that's okay. Because um, I think uh, what you mentioned about the oil industries, for us, that was a massive challenge. Um, because our, our briefs, as we, as we said it in the conversation with the publisher, was, okay, a book about books. And then the first issue that we ran into is, okay, what's a book? Book is a super recent invention. Is this stone carving? Is that a book? Um, so we've been yeah. quite liberal in interpreting what is a book, but then, yeah, how do, how do we include these um, books yeah, we, of oral philosophy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly. Huh? I mean, and it, there there are certain difficulties um, if you don't have a written form. Uh, but um, that's not a. I mean, written writtenness. No? That's that's not at all um, the last word. I mean, we do, and I mean, philosophy. I mean, what what's a philosophy? I mean, that philosophizing. That's an activity, and uh, certainly happens in storytelling. Certainly happens in um, oral traditions of a, a lot of indigenous um, um, groups and cultures and histories. Yeah? So um, it's only from our definition of philosophy um, that focuses on argumentation, that focuses mm -hmm. on certain canons. Um, maybe it doesn't belong there, but that, that, that's, that, since these categories themselves are mm -hmm. uh, recent, uh, ours, uh, well, who's who are we to say that you know, what counts and what doesn't count? Yeah, so uh, and this actually place. was huh? yeah. I mean, I think this is also one of the things that uh, Chris and I experienced, and also yeah. when, we, when we spoke before uh, with you, Yoko, um, you mentioned about kind of rituals and like there are other forms of practice that aren't just yeah. like oral. Um, and I think the exclusion of these kind of traditional, um, like performative philosophical philosophical practices, um, the exclusion of that from the Western canon means that um, a lot of the time in Anglophone philosophy, certainly mm -hmm. people don't attend to the, to the kinds of rituals that are actually at play. So, you yeah. know, meeting in a seminar room and the way that everybody yeah. kind of like, and, and, the, and the forms of behavior that you see time and yeah. again within, uh, you know, the, the, the academy, it's, yeah. these are rituals and they are conveying a certain type of information. Um, but right. because we're like, oh no, you know what? It's only books. Um, right. That's yeah, it creates a it creates a, a problem and a, and a and a and a lacuna in the way that we understand philosophy. And that was one of the things that I found really excited about your project. Right. Uh, so, we, so what's happening is that we are trying to now do a historiography of the history, now historiographies mm -hmm. of the histories of philosophies in a global perspectives. So it's sort of multiplying these uh, perspectival um, yeah. meta levels. Now we have to um, always question ourselves and that is itself the act of philosophizing, right? So we always uh, say, well, what, what, what do we presuppose and why do we think that this fits or this doesn't fit? No? But it's always uh, an occasion to uh, reflect. And uh, if you think of, um, philosophical questions, what are philosophical questions? Yeah, philosophical questions about life. Um, also, those are sort of very broad. And yeah. um, so long as uh, cultures have existed, uh, the questions have been asked. Mm -hmm. And if you think of in these global um, ways, what we do as academic philosophers since the 19th century in the United States and um, Europe, those are very specialized, narrow kinds of things. And then we think of ourselves so important and say, oh, well, you know, um, that's, that's what philosophy is, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't think, I mean, that kind of 
age is over. I mean, we are now in the next um, stage of philosophizing or the, or, um, the reconceptualizations of philosophy um, that would uh, again, uh, um, it should again be diverse and robust. Like it's it cross. Cross. yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say it's interesting that you say it, we're moving into the next phase because um, that sounds quite optimistic. I think Adam and I. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's totally quite <laughs> critical about the state of things. <laughs> and of um, course, what we have uh, gone through in the last hundred years in philosophy, that's also mm -hmm. important. So it's like, it's not like um, not, that should be gotten rid of or something like that, or anything goes. I mean, that's not also true. So um, it is a constant um, a question asking. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a final answer that we can nail onto, but rather we should think of the question, questioning themselves as the process. Yeah. I, the way say, the I, I mean, I, yeah. something, and I'd be interested to know, obviously, both of your thoughts on this, but I think one of the things that I ended up feeling quite cynical about, and, and the original title of the book was Philosophical Empires, which is why the title of this talk this evening is Philosophical Empires. Um, and we, Chris and I, were both very conscious of the way that philosophical concepts and theories had been mobilized to imperial ends. And yeah. so this idea of, um, you know, thinking about how we're reconstructing the history of philosophy or the historiography of, of philosophy, um, the, the, the cynical part of me is thinking, oh, well, actually, yeah, but this is because it's politically mobilized and, a certain way and this is something that we've seen time and again throughout history so I yeah I don't know I, I wonder I wonder where you both kind of fall on that I mean uh, I would say it's entirely um, cast in political I mean it is a part of the the big um, problem with um, one example would be these uh, the, the enlightenment liberal principles right I mean, of um, rationality that human mind ought to be not rationality and that was used to exclude all kinds of people who are deemed to be not rational yeah i mean so even sort of like um innocuous ideas like that could be could always be used as a tool of um exclusion women mm -hmm. has been excluded on that basis um the rest of the non-europeans have been excluded on the basis as well. mm -hmm. and then yeah, you name a category, and that that that's I I would say it's never innocent. No. Yeah, and I think I think we can also ask it. So when we were talking about philosophical empires, like what is empire? So when yeah. when we were talking about it in the book, it's mostly an empire, like a collection of states or or nations or countries um, ruled by a single ruler, a single authority. What is empire today? I mean. Is this the empire of Netflix? Is this the empire of Facebook? I mean, how is our how are our ideas, how are our philosophies, and what we want to include in next week shaped by um, those massive driving forces? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I don't think the philosophies were um, created for uh, for uh, political or imperial purposes. I don't think that's true, but somehow um, co-opted, right? Yeah, and then also. I mean, if you if you think of today's um, yeah, let's we do argue that, that in some chapters, <laughs> Netflix or the, this this form of a sort of like a global permeation of all forms of, um, I mean that too um, on on the on the language of well, everybody has access uh, somewhat was on the egalitarian um, uh, story, but in fact is based on um, access. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you don't have um, is a know-how, then you're out. Or if you don't like it, then actually you're out, right? So it's, it, it is a very um, fundamental you know, from, um, form um, that creates a, a culture. It's, it, I'd say, I'm, I'm being, yeah, uh, I, I, I kind of want to know, and perhaps I'm partly guessing what Chris might think about this, but um, I suppose uh, we both in the book push back on this thought that philosophy is, is created prior to um, its political mobilization and rather that it's a kind of dynamic reciprocity. So you actually, I mean, you know, you have uh, philosophies deeply intertwined with 
um, political moments. And this actually was one of the things that was so surprising to me. I mean, uh, as somebody who doesn't know um, about Jainism and about um, Buddhism extensively researching it and finding out exactly how revolutionary these movements were, uh, also Christianity um, and what they did to the surrounding society uh, and what and, and it was done in relation to injustices at the time. Mm. Um, yeah. And then I, I think it's, it's because of all these things is the philosophy um, important because through our uh, reflective skills or through our um, yeah, ways of being able to step out yeah, and to um, examine. I mean, those are philosophical activities so that uh, we, are, we are sort of caught, but we are not. Yeah? We, are, we, we can um, move to the middle level and sort of meta philosophize what does this mean i mean these are fundamentally philosophical mm -hmm. questions that we are, um, are good at asking right so that mm -hmm. entire activity of critique itself is of in a way that's what philosophy is right so it's the it's on the one hand it's the content philosophy that gets used in this way and this way and that way but it's also philosophy to be able to see that and to produce um maybe even a systematic critique. Why, and then and that has to do with, you know, what kind of historical conceptions that we, uh, um, we form and what part of the world are affected by this and how the power dynamic still shapes our world. I mean, these are all mm -hmm. political but philosophical questions. It's not always to see from your own situation where your blind spots are, like what you're going to look at. I mean, we've tried, yeah, I think this is also then comes on to the, the limits of what we were able to include. Um, yeah, yeah. Because what was the, right, what was the motivation for writing this book? Uh, <laughs> money, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think, as, so, uh, I, I, as I say, I was approached um, by Ivy Publishing, and I'd worked with them before, and um, I worked with Tom before, and that was an inducement to, to do it again. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that certainly appealed to me was that it's a trade book, and um, when you go out and you look in the shops um, and you look for introductory books to philosophy and philosophical history, then you'll get the kind of like the classics, the Bertrand Russells or whatever, mm -hmm. and they tell a very, very specific story. And so um, from my point of view, it felt, it feels important to tell uh, a, a more critically engaged story of who philosophers are and what philosophy is, um, not at the kind of top, 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 top academic level, but much more at the kind of like entry level. Um, and that's, and they've done a really wonderful job making the book look really beautiful. And um, yeah, so, and, and, and kind of like in, as inclusive to a, as wide an audience, I think as possible. And that, that was a strong incentive to me actually. Yeah, yeah I think that's fine. Yeah. yeah. And then, Chris, you do um, history of um, science, no? and then I, my question would be, no, you're good, philosophy <laughs> of science. Um, do you see that it's true that in these uh, historical process, especially say um, post the 18th century, philosophy became more and more scientific, let's just say, and, um, or at least uh, philosophy wanted to be like science and then that was when um, science also really took off and um, and that had an effect on who to exclude, let's just say. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that um, the process of uh, yeah, certain philosophers becoming inducted with science is also quite local. So I'm not sure whether you see that in the same way in with all philosophy, uh, philosophers and philosophical culture cultures across the globe. So I think, yeah, definitely um, Europeans were really um, uh, driving this idea of, um, well, this uh, wish to be scientific, but also this, this demarcation of disciplines is what you see, see coming uh, around this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that was actually... So 
Oh, sorry to, sorry, sorry sorry to sorry. jump in. Yeah, it was actually one of the things that I found really difficult in terms of the writing mm. is that it becomes so much more specialised and we've, yeah, yeah. So we've all organised the book kind of roughly chronologically. Um, and that was that was tricky in itself and knowing w which periods we were going to focus on and, yeah. and whatever. But then you'll see it visually as you go through the book is that it just becomes, I mean, like by the end, obviously like printing technologies have changed, but you've yes. also got this like, like precisification of, of disciplines and specialities. That's and now right. we've got books on meta metaphysics and it's, it's, it's very, it's kind of strange knowing exactly what the political process is. It's hard to know what the political processes are that stimulate that um, mm. like atomization. Um, but I guess, and actually this is picking mm. up in one of the comments in the chat and, and Vroom um, is, is mentioning um, about the, uh, the way that um, academia exerts, a control, uh, uh, exerts control here and obviously like the academic industrial complex to a certain extent needs specialization and this is all I mean, I, I feel like there's, yeah, there's, there's a story yeah, to be told. That. Yeah, even, even the, the shaping of the academy as a career, like as a profession, the professionalization yeah. of, of mm. the universities um, yeah. and yeah. then commercialization and marketization in the mm. recent century. Mm. Mm. And I, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, Yoko, I was going to ask you something, if it's okay. Is that, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so I suppose one of the things that, um, Chris and I uh, were particularly interested in and are interested in more generally is co-authorship and collaboration. And one of the things that's so exciting about your project is, is, the, is the way that you are utilized. I mean, like there are all of these different people bring completely different and yet kind of similar linguistic skill sets to the table. And I, I just, I wonder what kind of conversations you've had around that and like what obstacles you've had to overcome in terms of that kind of collaboration. Uh, so um, we just um, we just uh, give the uh, speaker of the language the, the power to do the research, and then they would write a reflection on uh, what they have found, yeah, so mm -hmm. to speak. And then over these uh, entries that they have uh, made, and then we all read and discuss. Oh, uh, that's interesting. The how, um, not, for instance, Arabic. Yeah, um, oftentimes people think that is. Uh, also sort of synonymous with, with uh, Islam philosophy, but it, it's not, right? There are a lot of Indonesian Muslims who produce philosophical works that is not Arabic, yeah? So, I mean, these are sort of um, uh, uh, sort of emissions uh, that we find uh, and um, many, 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 many uh, concepts are not translatable. That's also mm -hmm. Um, an issue in working in different languages in philosophy. Histories are different, concepts are different, periodizations are different. Um, um, in um, Ch Chinese philosophy, for instance, I mean, the periodizations don't exactly match our sense of ancient medieval. I mean, yeah. these are sort of Gregorian mm -hmm. calendar, right? So it's yeah. not a sort of like a whole temporality, the conception of. Uh, what history is itself is different, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are what makes um, the conversation interesting in finding out, well, if you want to do philosophy on a global scale, uh, we can't really assume anything. We just encounter, find out, we have a conversation and we uh, try to negotiate. And then um, we try not to enforce our particular lens and say, or reinterpret, yeah. So, but, so yeah. the websites are so that each of the languages are on their own. The original language, the translation, and then it's a bibliography. And sometimes we have a clickable table of contents so that people can see, well, what is this from the 18th century um, China, yeah, for <laughs> on the history of philosophy, right. what do they include? And yeah. things of that sort, yeah. I mean, I this I'm just is gonna... Really Okay. Oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm conscious of time, um, yeah, yeah. and obviously time yeah. Yeah, is an accessibility yeah. issue. So I'm going to I'm going to um, shift yes. into question mode, if that's all right. Um, yes. And so the first one is um, from Yana Bachevic, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, so uh, very happily, uh, they're really enjoying the talk, um, and would like us 
to elaborate a bit on, imp uh, on the implicit enlightenment dimension of the project of correcting or re rewriting the canon. Are we assuming that the only or primary reason why the canon is Euro, white and male centred is because there's a lack of knowledge about other histories and thinkers? I don't think it's just a lack of knowledge. They had knowledge. They excluded right. them on the basis of knowledge. Yeah. Um, now there's a long, I mean, Hegel uh, is famous for this, but there's a long history of this uh, development thinking that um, human history develops to a civilization stage. That was sort of like a thought motif, if uh, you will, right? I know Hegel. So that the enlightenment happened in Europe. So, and then we became, yeah, uh, free from feudalistic thinking, we became free, enlightened uh, from religious fundamentalism, we became enlightened from uh, the hierarchical um, ways of organizing the world. Um, so it's like, based on this new thinking, um, the people who are backwards, yeah, these idea of barbarians and people who are backwards. So it became this history of development in which Europe was at the pinnacle of civilization, right? So anybody who didn't pick up on this picture, they were sort of behind and yeah. worth not knowing. And that was a reason why many non-Western, which just also means non-European white um, cultures and peoples, they were just deemed to be not worth the trouble. You know? in that way but before before that it was not that way i mean so it, it is like a recent history um, that that the, the knowledge world got organized in that way yeah chris did you yeah. have well yeah. no i definitely agree with what you said about the processes of deliberate explicit exclusion um but i also found it interesting the way um Yana put the question on um correcting the canon because, well, um, tell me other what you think about this, but um, I didn't see what we were doing as um, like writing, correcting the canon or as writing like the, the more correct version, because I'd be totally happy with like do away with all of this kind of rejection, do away with this we need a best of list. And as, as you know, speaking for myself, I think what I've tried to do in collaboration with you is just to the best of our abilities, um, as much as possible from the ground up and go to see what we find the text and you know, limited by our language capacities, write the history as we see it um, or as we can find it. I'm not saying that this is like the definite non exclusionary kind of thing we've missed so much because of not being able to read the language. Um, but yeah, here's another version. See if it works, see if you find new things in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, ju I mean, just to add to that before we jump on to the other yeah. questions, I think, again, one of the interesting things about Yana's question is the, is the, is the uh, use of lack of knowledge. So, uh, and that made me think of the, the Charles Mills um, idea um, uh, of uh, ignorance is not simply a kind of passive thing, but an active yeah. space. And it's not yeah. simply the lack of knowledge, but it's actually work being done often in terms Absolutely. of kind of like memory management. So yeah, I, I mean, I think that memory management um, is, is, is nurtures ignorance of a certain form and that's not a, just simply a lack of knowledge. Okay, so uh, I've got two, two questions. One is from Carolyn Jensen. Um, please could you say something about the different kinds of questions that may emerge in specific areas like ontology, epistemology, philosophy of mind and so on, if a more global perspective is taken? We all know how these fields are represented. Well, many of us know how these fields are represented in the traditional introductions, but how different could they potentially look? So um, ontology, epistemology, philosophy of mind. Um, and the, yeah, the, the ones that, you know, certainly in the Anglophone sphere are codified into modules that you take when you're at university. Hmm. Well, the three, yeah, very categories, right? The, the ontology, the epistemology, these are uh, our categories and it presupposes um, a certain comprehensions of, um, yeah, the fundamental questions are what a being is, what is it to know? Uh, that already uh, in, in um, many of the Asian 
uh, traditions um, since the subject and object are not clearly demarcated in our ordinary ways of uh, ontology uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to ask how are the subject and object then uh, related? These questions don't make any sense, right? So, and what is it to know? Uh, well, a lot of the body knowledge is included and mm -hmm. knowing epistemological activities are not uh, a, a conscious, not only a conscious kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, yes, they are quite different so much so that our usual our meaning European categories uh, may not actually adequately pick up what that's about. Yeah, so yeah. we have to step back even further to um, yeah read and talk to uh, philosophers from these traditions what the world is like. Yeah, so that's what we attempt to do. Yeah, one thing that I found really fascinating is regarding. We were going through these titles that we discussed in the book is how many of them deal with these questions of how to exist like how to live and philosophy not just how to well here's a formula but no like knowing this involves chanting this and this phrase right. over and over again and then you might come to a stage of existence or being or non-existence like um, um where you might grasp or exist in the right sort of way and that's that's radically different from the sort of philosophy that I was taught because it's really yeah. practical and it's really like you've got to do it you can't just follow the instructions it's really like action yeah yeah, yeah. as you say I mean embodied and I think this is one of the I mean like just to put it in in blunt terms I guess in response to Carolyn's question yeah. like, I guess if if things were taught in a more global way, then um, certainly uh, if you were doing philosophy of mind or something, it would involve uh, a degree of medita meditative practice, Medicine. possibly. Um, and it would be about embodied learning as much as it is about learning things from textbooks, perhaps. I don't, oh, yeah, okay. so it could, I mean, like dr dramatic things like that. Right, I'm gonna, uh, uh, so Martin, Hi, Martin, uh, has asked, which interesting philosopher uh, or philosophers did you discover while writing the book? Um, and so many. <laughs> so many, unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe we could broaden that out as well. It's just kind of like also um, with, with Yoko in mind, like which, which philosophical texts have surprised you and kind of like, you know, really, you've really enjoyed. I could say just very quickly, I mm. can say that the, the Babylonian Coalesce was one of my it was one of my number ones uh, so it's mm. a kind of it's a theodicy so it's something which is used to um explain away evil in the world given that god is all powerful and all knowing and all of that all of that stuff um and i think one of the th i mean so this is when is it it's kind of uh 1500 bce uh, have to, um, have to check we that. should have, we should have, <laughs> <laughs> should have researched in advance <laughs> yeah um but it's i mean i think this is one of the examples um as far as i'm concerned of uh, the politics and the philosophy like really working in tandem so this is uh, often thought about theodicies in general are often mm -hmm. thought about as kind of like abstract kind of paradoxical things it's like oh if god is so powerful and so good then uh what's the deal with evil and um, in fact, it's it's not really about that. It's I mean, well, I mean, in some sense it is about that, but in a lived sense, it's about how do we explain away the fact that we've got societal injustice a lot yeah. of the time? And yeah. then many of the answers are to, to the theod I mean, many of the answers to this question are, well, we can't understand the, you know, the workings of God's mind. So, um, you know, it's it's not up to us, and the same goes for the kings and the rulers who have direct access to the, to you know the the deity or deities. Anyway, yes, that mm -hmm. was mine. Perfect. Um, I think um, personally, I've really uh, over the recent time been fascinated by data visualization and um, other types of visualization. So what I've really what surprised me and what I really enjoyed was how many um, works. Uh, use visualizations as part of making their case for whatever they're making the case for. Um, and one favorite, which I think Adam you liked as well, was um, um, Mani, um, called the Azan, the picture book. Um, and it's just like these visions of how things are. <laughs> um, but yeah, also, like, 
throughout the different millennia that we studied, there's so many works of philosophy that, that weren't just, okay, here's three lines, here's my argument, with really effort put into um, yeah, illustrating the ideas and making them accessible to people yeah. who might not be literate. Yeah. I mean, for, for, for me, I mean, I, I can't uh, read them, but I learned learned about them through this uh, project. Uh, one of our um, researchers in our uh, team, Anka Granis, she's a specialist in the African traditions, mm -hmm. and that unbelievable richness of the literature coming out of uh, Africa, and I don't mean now, but historically, I mean, there's like a whole literature, um, philosophical literature that it's not at all um, um, sort of paid attention to uh, in our library, right? But they are fascinatingly um, varied and a lot of different topics have been covered and also um, the views about um, Europe. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, these things are discussed, I mean, I mean, so these are sort of surprising things. I mean, mm -hmm. at least I was also surprised about the European tradition before the, the 19th century. Yeah. How rich it was in global philosophy terms that, yeah, as so many things were included, um, but not now, right? So yeah. that I didn't know. I mean, I just thought the Europeans always did European philosophy, but it's not true. I mean, they knew a lot about yeah, India, uh, Sanskrit, China, and also the Jewish and Babylonian. I mean, these things were known. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we might have to do a slight, we've got five minutes left, so we might have oh. to do a slightly a quick fire round. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's start with Michael Babbage's question. Can you explain why philosophical traditions other than our own are, and I think it's construed not just as different, but as fake. So, <laughs> for example, you know, uh, the continental tradition as seen from the analytic tradition. I think I've understood Michael's question yeah, uh, yeah. or the, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, my quick interpretation of that is that, um, well, if I take that, um, they're not just labeled as different, but as fake as they're not even philosophy. This, um, it's just pretending to be philosophy. I think um, that's a very, if you have that, in your hand, that you are the arbiter of what is philosophy or, or uh, is not philosophy. It's a very powerful tool of not having to bother about it and um, being able to completely ignore it. So I think if it's just different, but still philosophy, then you still got to take it seriously. And you can't just like hire your mates and all projects, but you have to take these other people serious as well. And if it's just not even philosophy, then you can just throw it, yeah, throw it on the board. So, um, it's still easier to dismiss and ignore if uh, you can label other traditions as, as fake. As, yeah. um, or as, as Harry Frankfurt puts it, bullshit, which is his clinical term right. for talking sure. about. <laughs> yeah. 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 What do you reckon, the okay? I think that's just bad philosophy to right. call somebody a fake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just bad attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Do, 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 okay, do so, yeah, uh, two, two final questions I think we've yeah. got time for. Um, as a lay, this is from T. Stevens. Yeah. As a lay person, philosophy is pretty difficult to start with. This is true. Uh, with the broadening of the canon that we're talking about, um, is it going to become even more impenetrable? Are there, or are there patterns emerging? And if there are patterns emerging, emerging who is going to decide what they are? Um, so that's, I, I, yeah, I feel that's a really interesting um, question. We also have a question from uh, anonymous attendee, um, yeah. which is, uh, how do we actually rewrite this history, these histories, what is to be done? And I kind of, I mean, I'm just uh, extrapolating from that. Yeah. I, I think that possibly these two questions together um, are, are, are quite interesting in, in the sense that they, suggests that there are actually methodological obstacles mm -hmm. um, to doing the kinds of projects that we're all engaged in. So if you if you want to create a history of philosophy, okay. there is always a selection process. I mean, this is something that we've been saying, yeah, there's sure, always sure, a selection sure. process going on. Yeah. So how do we, how do we um, 
kind of ameliorate the the whatever political forces are, are flowing through us. Well, I, 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 yeah, I, I think I it's already it's... Ha happening. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Oh, no, I just want to say I have a suggestion for how to approach it, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of collaboration. I would think make as many texts um, as possible, accessible to as many people as possible in as many languages as you can. And yeah. um, doesn't have to be published work, like put stuff on the internet, um, like perform stuff on your in your local theatre, like um, get make, make sure that people have access to um, the works and then because people can begin to find their way it doesn't have to in my view it doesn't have to be that everyone must learn this list of 100, 100 works or whatever if if there are certain if there's a certain collection of work that resonates with someone that's fine they find their path through that so yeah i think the burden is work collectively work together to make uh, works accessible yeah um, so it doesn't happen in like a couple of years, right? But um, I mean, start reading books like from Adam and Chris. That's a start. And then also, <laughs> Thank I mean, you. <laughs> it's true. I mean, in English, in English, there are over 20 books, 20 anthologies already yeah, in the last 10, 15 years mm -hmm. already produced on global history of philosophy, uh -huh. world histories, world history books. As well, the material is available. And yeah. I mean, like I say, I mean, that's not just a one, I mean, a few years thing. It's just, we look at the next 20 years maybe and syllabus alterations, different kinds of things that are, can be taught. And at the, uh, the, the University of Hildesheim, our director now, Professor Rolf Elberfeld, he teaches these global histories of philosophy as mm -hmm. philosophy courses and um, people come in and they have no previous uh, idea about philosophy. And if that's the introduction, they would think that philosophy is global, right? So like they, they don't have this previous idea that, oh my God, we have to now learn global philosophy, but from the beginning, it is global yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. diverse. Mm 